there is bending is axial bending. So for example, in this particular case, the point C is the extreme point of the beam, the extreme locations of the beam. That's called C. This is the neutral axis. So anywhere, so for example, somebody was to say, this is my Y. So that's positive Y because it's Y going up and that's my negative Y. So eventually when Y going this way or that way up to the extreme point, it will become C. So in this particular case, the moment around the beam is this way. That's why this is in compression and this is in tension. That's in compression, the top part, and that's in tension. See that? What is in the middle? The middle is neutral. If somebody wants to find out, give me a compression from here to here. So if you correlate that, there will be that much of compression right there. This is at this particular point, extreme point, there will be that much of compression. Why is it negative? Compression is negative. Tension is positive. In bending, the formula is sigma is equal to m y over i. But y eventually, into the extreme point, becomes c. So you can also say is sigma is m c over i. So there's a moment of inertia right there. And that is at the extreme point. Here, the negative is because we're looking at positive y. So it, this is negative because it's in compression. And the maximum will be at that particular point, mc over i. All right. So if this in this case, it's uh, negative over here. It's tension over here. So there will be two maximums at the extreme points. One is a negative and one is positive both of the same magnitude. Again, finishing the S over here. S is called the elastic section modulus. It's proportional sh shape. Okay, so what that is, is I over C. And I is the, is the moment of inertia. Where do you find this moment of inertia? Everybody kindly go to page number 69 and look at the fourth row. And the fourth row, if you look at it, the moment of inertia is on the third column. IXC is BH cubed over 12. Everybody understands the difference between IXC versus IX. Everybody understands the difference between those two. Hmm. Okay. Did you guys have your static class yet? Okay. All right. Let me refresh your memories. Pay attention, please. It's not part, part of the curriculum, but I want to make sure because a lot of my students have the same problem and I don't want to go further till they understand it. Assume that's my y-axis and that's my x-axis. So if this is my rectangle, that means this shape of the beam right there, the middle portion is my neutral axis, which is right there. Now, if I draw, this is as my y and my x, if this particular, this particular body right there is rotated around x axis, then you use i x, you use i x, which is b h cubed over 3. But since this is my centroid, my distance is xc, so what I'm going to do that when it rotates around, 
the x-axis of that that is my ixc likewise the other way is my iyc rotating that way versus iy rotating that way what rotates that way this particular beam the end will rotate like that if you're going through a y okay i would urge you to if you don't still understand to refresh it because we have a lot of other things to catch up all right now this uh, elastic section modulus is provided on page 82 and i think it's also embedded in a paragraph so good luck if you're looking for a formula because it's embedded there so be careful about that and it's on page 82 right hand column just above the words transverse shear stress it said s is equal to i over c and it's called the elastic section modulus of the beam c is the extreme point and you can go up one more line it'll say that c is called distance between the neutral axis to the outermost fiber of a symmetrical beam section symmetrical beam section so if the beam is like this it's not symmetrical all right so we learned about bending now let's look up at shear shear and i'll be very fast in this no more than one minute it's just like an airplane i don't know why i'm using this example i'm flying to la tomorrow i don't know why i'm saying this but it's okay and the wing is like that so what happens is now there's naturally another wing like that i'm not gonna draw it i don't have time for that right now is so what happens if there's too much of air just imagine on this particular wing from the top eventually there'll be so much of stress that the wing will shear from the body the wing will shear from the body In the same concept if this particular beam was to shear from the body then at the neutral axis is where the highest shear stress is at the neutral axis so in this particular case the neutral axis has got the highest shear point but in the middle over here the shear is zero so let me erase this there goes my plane so here the shear stress at three o'clock position is the highest and if i was to redraw this and complete it then the maximum shear stress is at nine o'clock and the three o'clock position and is zero at 12 and six while here in neutral axis in axial bending is zero while in shear the neutral axis is where the highest shear stress is that formula is provided by here all right and the shear will occur this way it'll shear the wing is going to shear and this was the wing like that for example all right okay let me raise this in order to find the transverse shear flow the formula is given on page 82 that's where the shear would occur so in this particular case the shear comes down this way down all right all right so we've finished that the analysis of beams now we're going to section number six which is the deflection of beams and yes integration is back oh i love it double integration all right you don't have to worry about this this slide will take no more than a minute to understand if somebody gives you a deflection deflection is why what does that mean so if, for example here is a beam and i'm exaggerating it and it is at the reaction points are here and there was a force induced right there originally it was like this the beam now you know now it is deflected by that distance y deflection going down 
let me just verify that. Deflection going down is one second. Yeah, deflection going down in NCS reference handbook is negative. Go to page number 85. Look at the first row. Third column is deflection. You can see P is in the middle. It deflects by that particular point. V max and it's negative. See that? Anything that is just an NCS book, they show it that way. It's negative. That means it's just going down. Okay, that's why Y is up. In Y is up over here. In the Y. So if it's down, it's negative. Okay, let me just erase this. So if somebody gives us an equation, the deflection equation, and they say, find a slope, what we do is we take the first derivative. So they'll give you an equation of the uh, deflection equation. What does that mean? The deflection equation is what is deflected right there. Over here, there's no deflection. See that? There's no deflection. So there's going to be a parabolic equation that will be provided here. Most likely it will be x squared minus something to x plus y, whatever, and that's what you're going to get. Oh, I mean, plus 3 or something like that. So once you have that, then what you do, you find the first derivative of it, and you can get the slope equation. The slope equation. If you get the slope equation, and somebody says, give me the moment differential equation, you integrate, you, you differentiate it one more time, and you'll get the moment. Once you get the moment differential equation of the deflection curve, because this was a deflection curve, you take one more derivative, then you find the shear differential equation. You do one more, and you'll find the load. So remember when we were drawing the load diagram, do shear diagram, from shear, we were drawing the moment, and integration was playing. Same thing over here. Watch this. Let me erase it. One second, please. Okay. So, and it goes down. If you go this way, you are differentiating it. If you're going that way, you're integrating it. This is integrating it. This is differentiating it. So, if somebody was to give us a moment differential equation and says, get me the load differential equation, you differentiate it twice. Once and twice, and you get your load differential equation. If somebody gives us a shear Differential equation says, give me the deflection curve. You integrate it once, you integrate it twice, and you integrate it three times, and you will get your deflection curve. Hence, the deflection at a section of beam solving by double integration method, if moment is known, so if moment is known, which is here, then I have to integrate it twice, one and two times, to get my y which is my deflection do you need to memorize this no go to page number 80 83 left hand column way at the top there and those formulas are provided these three formulas are provided right there all right and the other two are provided, these two are provided below. Just go underneath where it says determine the deflection curve equation. And underneath that, this is provided and that's provided. Okay? Okay, let's finish it off. <clears throat> okay.
Okay, let's continue. Now, next is when there's a curvature, K is called the curvature of a beam. It's identified on page 83. K is called the curvature of the beam. While the radius of the curvature is called rho, sometimes also known as r. So what we need to take out of from here is this formula. You find your maximum strain occurring, which is C over R. C is, remember, from neutral axis to the extreme point, which is my C. R is the radius of curvature from here to the neutral axis. So the maximum strain, which is here, will occur when we divide the distance C by R. But C, but we know K is equal to 1 over R. So here K, right there K, is 1 over R, which is the same thing as 1 over rho. And rho is the radius. That's why we use also the word R. This is identified on page 20-4 of FIRM, 3rd edition. I encourage you to look it up. The formula is, as I said, is on page 83. You don't have to memorize it. And if you look at this, and all you have to take out is this, out of this particular slide. This thing is just to illustrate how you got your tau, sorry, your normal strain to be maximum. And it's just proportional, just like what we did with that x versus 12 minus x, same concept. This from here to here is r, and that's my tau, my normal strain maximum. That's my, my normal strain itself at the distance y. Y is from here to here. C is from here to here. Let me erase this. Again, as I was mentioning, the key thing we need to take out is that we know that sigma is Young's modulus multiplied by normal uh, strain. When we know the normal stress sigma is equal to my over i. And based on that, this is what you have to remember. E maximum is C over K. And we know what K is. K is 1 over R. Remember? K is 1 over R or 1 over rho. Same thing. So I can replace that K with R because it's inverse, and that same thing as we just discussed about right here. Let me erase this. So we know that that maximum is CK, so the maximum stress is Young's modulus by the normal strain maximum, and that is we're just replacing with the uh, radius of curvature. You know, all they'll ask is they'll give us a couple of these questions, and there'll be one unknown, and you just solve it. Be attention, please mark this particular one down. Note that the elastic section modulus of a beam S is equal to 1 over rho. S is equal to 1 over rho. Okay. Let's look at an example. Here, this is so simple. Tops, 50 seconds, one minute tops to solve this problem. Here's a configuration given. They said to find the deflection. This is the load. It's uniform load. So what we do right away, 
is we go to one of these pages, which is either on 85 or 86. So let's go to 86. It's a cantilever beam. Look at the second one. It's exactly opposite to this. They're asking us, find the tip deflection. That means what is the tip deflection over here? So if I was to draw this exaggerating it, it deflect like that. So what is that distance? So if you look at it, and row number two, column number three, which says deflection is negative. Negative is because it's going down, as I explained to you, is negative W L to the power four of eight E I. That's where this comes from. I've omitted the word, I mean the symbol negative, because we can see it's going down. They're not going to play the games with you about negative and positive. They will not. They just want to try and figure out where you get if you get this particular answer. And the deflection is all this is provided. It's just plug and play into this equation, and it's going 0.077 meters. And if it's going down, so it's naturally is negative. It's going down. If this is my y is positive up, they can give us any configuration. So look at look at for example. One, two, three. Look at the fourth row of 86, page 86. They may give us that, and they say, okay, give me the deflection at the tip. And it's minus 7 WL to the power 4 with 384 um, bracket EI. Okay, so it's just getting the right formulas and to solve it. Okay, now we're going to go to composite beam. Sometimes what happens is sometimes we use one, more than one type of material. And we do that, and once we have two different types of material, it becomes a composite beam. So instead of having wood, for example, let's say you look wood as an example. So if I have a wood like that, one beam is this way, and the bottom one is like that, but it's all made of wood. In order to sustain X amount of stress, what kind of stress? If there's a bending moment, for example, if I was to draw in 3D, and I was putting a torque around here and torque around that way, and we know this part, particular point is going to be in compression, this is going to be in tension. And, and if we want to sustain a long or higher quantity of that particular stress, then maybe exaggerating that this particular beam would be so thick that it's not realistic. So we can, instead of doing that, we may, as engineers, design to have wood, because there was a reason why they wanted to use wood in one side, let's say. But then we use a steel plate but of a smaller width than if it was wood. If it was wood, it would have been like that, maybe. And that's why if materials of two different materials, it's called composite beams. So sometimes in an application de design, depending on the design requirements, we may have to use two different types of materials to make that beam. And that's called composite beam. In composite beam, we have, no, we have to know two things. Number one, we have to find the combined moment of inertia of the transformed section. What does transformed section mean? That material is of two different types. So, for example, this is my wood. I'm exaggerating it now and making it so thick versus the small plate of steel, let's say. Where would the neutral axis be? Well, the neutral axis would be somewhere here. Okay, now we need to find the moment of inertia of the transformed section. That's one thing we need. The second thing we need to find out is called the modular ratio, where there are two different types of material. That's material number one, and that's material number two. then 
what will happen is we want to make sure that the modular ratio is always greater than one. The modular ratio is the, it's called C. I'm sorry, N, pardon me. So we, we take the, the material with the higher Young's modulus, divide by the weaker one. So the modular ratio will always be greater than one. It cannot be less than one. Now, what happens if it's one? What happens if the modular ratio is one? What does that mean? Correct, it's the same material because E1 is same as E2, so that's why it's one. That the beams are same. So, but that's not the case in composite beams because we know the beams are of different material, but it can never be less than one. It has to be greater than one. Okay, so let's go look at it and try and figure out how to solve this. Now pay attention to this, please. Everybody kindly go to page number 67. And you see where it says, where it says in the right hand column, in the middle of the page, it says the centroid of area is defined as XAC is equal to M AY divided by A and the summation of x multiplied by area divided by area. Uh, I'm sorry, x divided by the x n multiplied by a, a distance divided by the area. And I'll explain that to you in a second. So that's where it comes from, this particular formula right there. This formula y c is equal to m summation of m over summation of the area. So what our aim is to find this neutral axis. And we need to find why? We need that because we want to find IT, which is the moment of inertia of the transformed section. Our modular ratio, we know it's, it's simple. It is the, the <clears throat> heavier material, which has got larger Young's modulus, divided by the weaker one. So it's, this has got to be always greater than one. Now, in order to find the neutral axis first, this is what we need to do. We need to find the centroid of the area. So the centroid of the area is the summation of the moments divided by the summation of the area. So let's look at it. I'm going to draw an x-axis and a y-axis. That's my x. That's my Y. All right. Let's look at this particular material first. This one. Area A. Area A is 2 millimeters by 8 millimeters. 2 millimeters by 8 millimeters. Got it? But it has to rotate to get the moment. It's 1 millimeter to the centroid of it. Why 1 millimeter? Because this is 2 millimeter, so the centroid is 1 millimeter. So that's that one millimeter right there. So we found the moment of area A right there. But we also need to find the moment of area B. So area B is what? The area itself is four times six, which is given right there. Four times six. Now what is this five? Well, the five is this particular area, the centroid of this area, is right there, which is if it's six millimeter, so this will be three and three, correct? But however, this is two from the x axis. So this two plus this three is five because it goes to the center of area B. So I got that now. I divide, let me erase this now.
Then I divide by the area. The area of what? Area A, which is 2 by 8, and then area B, which is 4 by 6. And if I do that, then I'll find out that my neutral axis is 3.4 meters from the x-axis going up. So it is 3.4 meters. Yes, it is right there. So I draw my neutral axis now. However, go to page number 68 of NCS, left-hand column, way up top. It's called the moment of inertia of parallel axis theorem. This area is rotating around here, but we don't want it to rotate around there. We want it to rotate around here now, which is the neutral axis. So in order to do that, I need to find Ixc of that area, and I know this distance, and I do the parallel axis theorem, which says you take the Ixc of that area multiple plus the square root of this distance times the area itself. So let me erase that. So what are we going to do now is we're going to take the first area. Okay, so remember is B h cubed over 12. Go to page number 69. And you go to the fourth column. And the, uh, sorry, the fourth row, the third column, i x is b h cubed over 3. Is that what we need? No, it's rotating around the centroid. That area is rotating around the centroid right now. So I need the IXC. What is IXC? IXC is BH cubed over 12. Right here, BH cubed over 12. I know my base, B. I know my height. What is my height now? It's 2 right there, which is here. So BH cubed over 12. So I got this, this area A rotating around its own centroid, but I don't want that. I want it to rotate around the neutral axis. So I have to add this, which is d squared times the area. So what is the distance from the centroid of the area 1 to the neutral axis? It is 2.4 millimeters. How do I know that? Because I knew my neutral axis is 3.4, and I, I take this 1 millimeter away to the centroid. Now it becomes 2.4. So 2.4 squared multiplied by the area, which is 8 times 2. I got that one now. I do the same thing with area B. Same thing, B h cubed over 12. And then I take that distance, which is 1.6 squared, multiplied by the area of this, this beam, this portion of the beam. Now, if we do that, we add it up together. Now we found the moment of inertia of the transformed structure. That means... Both this beam and that beam is now rotating around the neutral axis. Contrary to before, this was just going by itself around its own centroid, and this was going around its own centroid. So we once we find the transformed moment of inertia, and we know the modular ratio, now everything is solved easily. One second, it's just erasing. Okay. So th this formula, you don't have to memorize it. It's provided on page number 83. And if you just move, I would just move the moments around here to give you, to, to make it easier for you if moment is, to be found. All right? N is the modular ratio. IT is the moment of inertia of the transformed composite section, not the beam by itself. Remember the modular ratio? Member 1 has to be stronger than member 2. N can never be less than 1. 
or one. If it's one, then it's the same material. We're going to look at the final three slides. Here, we're looking at eccentric loading. What does eccentric loading mean? So far, remember from yesterday when I was teaching you about a rod like this, and there's a force coming out here, and a force coming out there, P, that was coming exactly at the neutral axis. That's the neutral axis right there. But in this particular case, no, we are putting a force F at E distance away from the neutral axis on either side. So there's one also on this side, by the way, if I was to finish this. Hence, if you want to look at from this angle, that's what this is. That's my F and that's my F. But that F is E distance away from the neutral axis. There you go, the E distance away. C is the extreme point. So if somebody was to give us F, which is E distance away, let me erase it. E distance away, then what will happen is they'll be as good as having a torque. So let me draw a torque. I can take this F out. I can take it out and I replace with the torque like that. I can take this out and replace with the torque like that. That torque, or the moment you want to call it, is what? F times E, right? Force times distance is my moment. So here, what we can do, there are two things that's happening with this particular force. It is causing an axial stress, and it's also causing a moment, like bending stress. So first one is axial, which is force over area, which we have learned. And the second one is MCI, which we learned, which was MY over I, which is my stress. One is positive, one is negative. Why? Because one is in compression, one is in tension. And M is equal to F times E. So if the column and the compression member is loaded with an eccentric compression load, not in the centroid, tension will exist when the MCI term is greater than the FAA term. So tension will exist if this term is greater than that term. So the two stresses that's induced over here are due to axial and then the moment, which is going around like a torque, like a moment, like that. That moment is F multiplied by E. Finally, last two slides. We're going to look at buckling of the loads of columns, which is Euler's load. The critical load that causes a long column to buckle is that's a critical load. What does that mean? If there's a long column like that, and there's a force coming this way of P, then at the one particular point, exaggerating it, this thing is going to buckle. What does unbraced mean? Unbraced means that it is like that. There's nothing supporting it. If it's braced, if it's braced, for example, that means it's like a jacket of some strength that goes around the centroid over here on the metal, for example. So, and it's strapped around here so to give that column more strength. So what we are looking at is in this particular example, we are looking at this formula is for unbraced column length. That means nothing is supporting it in the center. That is the formula. It's on page 83. You don't have to memorize it. Please be, be careful over here. Look at page number 83 for a second. 
If you go page number 83, the right-hand column way up top there, that's a uh, critical load, PCR, which is right there. L is the unbraced length. L is the unbraced column length. K is the effective length factor, which I'm going to show you as to where you get that K values. Then if you go further down, the Buckley stress for long columns is right there, which is given. All you have to do is substitute that with this. R is the radius of gyration, which is square root of I over A, and I is the moment of inertia. It's not one, this is not one, and neither it is in your formula there. And finally, KL over R is the effective slenderness ratio. And please be careful this time, this L is the length. So where do we get these K values from? You can find it on page 162 of your NCS. There are two types of K values. Be careful about that. One is the theoretical and what is the recommended design value. They will ask you which one of those two we need. So for example, if it's fixed, fixed, theoretical K value is 0.5. So how do I know that's fixed? Well, it says over here that's fixed. So these are both fixed. Here is fixed and it's rotation free, but translation fixed. See that? Then I, if it's theoretical K value, I take 0.7. If it's recommended design value, I'll take 0.8. All right, all these configurations are given over here. You just pick the K value, plug it in here. This E, you know what is Young's modulus? That's modulus, that's moment of inertia. L is the length. You'll find the critical load. All right? All right, so. If they don't say, no, if they don't, they will not do that. They will say, just give me a theoretical va value. And if they don't give it to you, I doubt it. They will say that I would go with the theoretical K value. All right. Now, look, we've got, we've got 12 minutes left. This is the end of the slide. Your choice. There are three questions left, which you can take it as homework. You're going to get the solutions by noon, uh, midnight uh, tonight. Would you like me to go over the entire review or do you would like me to go over the three questions? Okay, that's two questions. Sold. I think this, the, the questions will help you out a lot more. Okay, let's go. We finished number question number 12. Now 15, pardon me. So question number 16. This is a roller at support B. Support B it is supported by a square cast iron column that is 80 centimeters square and 8 meters long. Let me draw that. So this is 8 centimeters squared and this is 8 meters long and it's cast iron. The elongation due to the load on the roller, so that means the roller, the roller is sitting right here, okay, on top here like that. It says is what? So what I need to do, I need to find out what is my reaction at point B, correct? Now if I ask, if I, I want to find my reaction at point B, why would I take my reaction at point A? Oh, sorry, why would I take my, my, uh, why would I first solve for reaction at point A? I'm wasting my time. I should just find B. 
So if I was to find B, I would take my moment around point A, and you guys know how to get this as a one uh, concentrated load. This is there. This will be two thirds of the distance. And if you do not know that, go to page 69 and you'll see that. And this one is going to be one concentrated load over here, 1.5 meters from here, and you'll find the reaction at point B. So let's erase this now as I show it to you. So I take my moment at point A. A, which is true, so I can find my reaction force right there. So once I found my reaction force 369, and I want to know how much is elongated by, which is P, my P is 369, L is the 8 meters, E is cast iron, so I can go and find it, and A is the area which is 80 centimeters. E for cast iron is 100 gigapascal on the table of NCS84, and I find my, my elongation, which is 4.62 times 10 to the negative 5. So the next question, question 17. For an aluminum column with pinned ends, so I know what my K value is going to be. The cross-sectional area is this much. The factor and slenderness ratio is that. The critical axial load is what? From NCS book, we find the P critical over area is this. We know KL over R is my effective slenderness ratio. Look at page 83 of NCS, middle of the um, right hand column, just above the words elastic strain energy in bold. This is KL over R is the effective slenderness ratio. That's provided, right? 10. So that's 10. My aluminum Young's modulus is 69. This is provided. This is provided, 69. I know what my pi is and my area. My area is right there. I plug and play and I find my pre critical is 68.1. Finally, the problem is missing the centimeters for 10. There should be point. You mean here? One second. No, what are you talking about? That's 10 right there. All right, thank you. Finally, this is the most important one. Don't type any questions, please, because this is the one where if you understand this now, you'll we'll, we'll get in the next, we got seven minutes. I'd like to go over this one. So that way you get the composite beams uh, under control. A wood beam with the uh, area given has an aluminum alloy plate with the area given securely fastened to its bottom face, okay? The working stress in the wood and alloy I this, the working stress are provided. The moduli of elasticity of the wood is here, and the alloy is that. So alloy is stronger than wood. Determine the maximum moment of the wood beam of the composite beam can resist. What is the maximum? So let's look at it. Here's my wood. My aluminum is at the bottom, which is saved in the equation. I'm just going to draw fictitiously something. I'm going to say, okay, that's going to be my neutral axis. All right, and you, we know how to find the neutral axis now, and I'll show it to you still. Then what do we do? We find the, we find N, which is the ratio of the moduli itself, which is 70 over 8.75. Stronger material versus weaker, weaker material, which becomes 8. Now I have to find, I found my N, I have to find the moment of inertia of the transformed section. We learned that, how to find the neutral axis, which is again 15, 15 times 720 times 720. 
multiply by the distance to the centroid of that. So from here to here is 7.5 because this is 15. So I got area of the aluminum covered. I mean the moment around the aluminum covered. Then I have to find the same thing with 100 times 200. 100 times 200. Multiply by the distance from here to the centroid of that wood. Well, the centroid of the wood would be, this is 200 from here to here. So it's going to be 100 from here to here to the centroid. That 100 plus 15 is my 115. Divide by the area. So that area plus that area. And I get my neutral axis of the composite being to 77.3. So that means this distance to there here is 77.3. All right, now I have to find the parallel axis, remember? Because, because what's going to happen? I want you to rotate around the neutral axis, the composite beam. So in order to find that, I have to find the neutral axis, remember the parallel axis theorem? So it's B H cubed over 12. Again, it's the 750, 720 times that, plus that distance to the centroid, which is the neutral axis was 77.3, 77.3. So my neutral, my centroid is here, which is at 7.5. So 77.3 minus 7.5. Whatever it comes out to 69 point some change is what going to be my distance over here, d squared. Let's look at it. 77.3 minus 7.5 and 720 times 15, that's a square. And the other one is, oh, the other one is bh cubed by itself. So I have to take bh cubed of the centroid, bh cubed over 12, and then that distance d squared so this is right there that's for the alloy likewise I have to do the same thing with the wood and if you add them up together my transformed moment of inertia is 147 and the rest is just plug and play now the formulas which I provided and you want to find the moment and the moment to find the moment of the wood can resist, uh, otherwise after that it's going to crumble, and it's, that's the total moment it can resist. All right? I encourage you, when you get the solutions, please, I request and I urge you, do not look at the solution. I request and urge you, do not look at the solution first. Try and solve it. Then look at it to see where you're stuck. All right? It's now almost 10 o'clock. I want to thank you for allowing me to teach you guys and ladies. Wish you all the best. All right, stay focused. Remember the three rules. And my final rule, I don't want to see you. I wish you all the best. I'll see you when you do your PE. All right, uh, let me say my thanks to everyone. Thank you, Viviana. Alfred, thank you. Ryan G, thank you. Ryan Kier, thanks. Michael, thank you. Okay, thanks, Kim. Thanks for your kind words. Keisha, good luck. Thank you. Elaris, thank you. Appreciate your comments. Stephanie, thank you. And you have a great evening and good luck to everyone. James, thank you. Ali, thanks. Uh, the two formulas for PCO film are the same, correct? Yes, there would be. It's just A is in the bottom there. Look at the formulas in NCS and you'll figure that out. All right. Okay. Uh, Tomas, I hope I'm pronouncing your name correctly. Thank you. Gina, thank you. And safe travels. Okay, thank you. The, the wing is not going to come down. I'm, by the way, I'm flying by to LA from Orlando, American Airlines. Okay, if it comes down, wish me luck. Um... So long, thank you. Kim, good night.
Price, thank you for your kind words. You guys are great students. Elidis, thank you. Geber, thank you. Michael, thanks. Yeah, we got to laugh once in a while. No, no, I'm not frying United. No way. No way. Gabriel, thanks. Cooper, thanks. Alec, thanks for the for being part of my class. And thank you for all for participating, by the way. Thanks, Francis. Thanks, Nestor. It's you guys who make it interesting. Emmanuel, thank you, sir. Remember, you'll get your solutions midnight tonight. Uh, please do not look at the solutions. Please try and do the questions first. Oh, yeah, yeah, you'll get the beer. You just, just send me an email. I promise you, I'll send it to you. You know why? It's cheaper than having you come again. <laughs> Gina, thank you. Good night. Thanks, Alaris and Emmanuel. Thank you. <coughs> Excuse me. All right, I'm gonna just go and see which whom have not uh, I've not said bye to. David, are you okay? Ali, I think he mentioned it. Alfred mentioned it. Elidis did. Emmanuel did. Price did. David, are you okay? Giancarlo, Giancarlo, are you okay? James B. Jordan, Leif, you okay? Marco, are you okay? Good night, Michael. Nestor already said thanks. Oleg, thank you. Solom said thanks, I believe. But if not, thank you, Solom. And Wafa, Wafa, are you okay? All right. Okay. All right. Wish you all the best, all of you. And good luck. Go pound them. Good night. Thanks, Marco. Jordan, thank you. Good night.